uh, what did the word abstraction mean to O'Keefe? And and I want to expand on that a bit because when I did a show recently on the Kandinsky exhibit at the Guggenheim, listeners wrote in to complain that we were using the words abstract and non-objective interchangeably. Well, for O'Keefe, it it, um, actually changed over the course of her career. When she first started out in 1915, which was amazingly early, she really used abstraction to say things. And in her letters, again and again, you have um, her speaking about her urge to actually speak. Did you understand what I was trying to say? I made it to tell him something. And it was a way for her to express these ineffable, intense feelings that she couldn't put it, could not put into words. Well, it was an early time in abstraction. There were some other American artists working in that way, all coming out of nature like Arthur Dove. Yes, absolutely. I, and I think the only difference with O'Keefe in this early period is that she actually this sense that she was trying to express very intense personal emotions, not so much to extract the essentials from a subject, but to express something very personal. As you say, that that was a common thread among a number of artists. But O'Keeffe's early instinct that it was a language uh, of actually communication, that through through form and color, she could say things that couldn't couldn't be expressed were too ineffable for for words. It's the sort of thing that Kandinsky was saying when he said that uh, abstract art and music were similar, that you could say things uh, abstractly that you couldn't say through representational painting. Ab- absolutely. And the whole music is a paradigm for a, a, an abstract language that could express emotions was something that O'Keefe held dear, as as well as a number of her colleagues. Well, I think these paintings have always been around, but why have they not been given the same kind of attention the other work has well, received? Well, it's interesting. Uh, for one thing, they in the whole body of her work, she lived such a long time that she that their, the percentage of them was less than her other work, than the bones and the flowers. And then that work was was more accessible. It's easy to recognize a bone in the desert and to sort of feel the subject matter. And to to deal with an abstraction, one has to communicate with it. I think that they speak to to viewers. It's clear watching people go through the Whitney exhibition that she does tap into something that that resonates with people, that experience of the sublime, the sort of joy and exaltation that we have at moments of being in nature or being an experience that's totally overwhelming. Didn't she be- actually begin her career as an art teacher with little intention of becoming an artist? Well, that's what's so fascinating. She did. She came out of a, an, an art education tradition. She studied with a man named Arthur Wesley Dow, who really believed that art was something if, that that applied to everyday life, and that if you taught young children uh, harmony and, and principles that they could apply those that that harmonious sense of of a piece of paper and apply that to their everyday life. So he was saying that art had a social function. Absolutely. Did things change when she met Alfred Stieglitz? Um, it changed in the sense that when he brought uh, Stieglitz encouraged her to come to New York in 1918, and it was probably Stieglitz that encouraged her to turn to oil painting, which she did. In 1918, and then, of course, because he was her dealer, he was he promoted the work and was very instrumental in how it was appreciated by the critics. Well, he was a key figure in introducing Americans to the uh, avant-garde art of Europe, as well as uh, our own absolutely abstract, I mean, early was, abstract painters. Yes, I mean he taught America how to see abstraction and how to see modern art. And she was a student at Teachers College when they first met. That's right. Uh, the, the, was this a May? Was this a, you know, he was a lot older than he she was. He was 24 years her her senior. And she worked mostly in charcoal, which That's is right. hard to imagine. O'Keefe not using color in That's right. She's a great colorist. And then uh, she decided to expand <laughs> By using blue? Yes, that's right. She, there's a, we found a book at her library that advised artists to first use charcoal, work in black and white, and then when they turned to color, to begin to use one color at a time. And yes, blue was the color that she adopted first. And when did she show all of this work to Stieglitz? Well, there's the. It's interesting. The the sort of mythical story is that she she had been sending charcoals to a friend of hers, Anita Pollitzer, who was a classmate at Teachers College. And Pollitzer took the charcoals into Stieglitz's gallery on New Year's Day, 1916. 
And he clearly liked them. The, the sort of mythical recounting is that he said it last a woman on paper. And that may or may not be true. As it turns out, that was written in the margin of a letter rather than in the body of the letter. But he did respond to them, and they started corresponding at that point. 